Welcome, I'm Roy Prevo, and I am here to interview a very special guest. Let me just give you a little hint about how this man has achieved a certain level of, of achievement in his life. Um, let me just go through this. This man has, um, re re has won seven Genie Awards, which is the equivalent of the Canadian Academy Awards, two Golden Globe nominations, for including Best Foreign Film and Best Actor for The Grey Fox, uh, let me just go down this list. Recent Canadian Broadcasting Corporation production of Yellowstone Super Volcano, which will air on the Smithsonian Channel in the U.S. in 2014, and was the CBC's highest rated doc zone for 2013. I could go on, uh, but I won't, and I want to uh, welcome David Brady. Welcome. Thank you, Roy. It's great to be here. So... In your first book, Get Me to the Temple of Serenity and Step on It. What a great title for a book. <laughs> and I have Ed Bigley Jr. to thank for that. Um, I was having lunch with he and uh, he, uh, we were on a set, he was doing a movie and he said, <laughs> and he gave me that line and I said, I could use that. And he said, with pleasure, it's yours. Wow. Yeah. How cool is that? And I actually told him in Los Angeles, I said, thank you for the title, I used it. Then life progressed, and then you have a special event that happens in your life, and you're with your friend John. Could you elaborate on that? Tell about my that. best friend, <laughs> my oldest and best friend, Johnny Brower. Uh, Johnny and I met uh, when we were 14, um, and John was at Upper Canada College. I was at De La Salle, and that was the Anglican school up the street. And we were the only two kids in our neighborhood, and dear, I, we were both in Deer Park which is a very lovely neighborhood in Toronto between Young and Avenue Road, you know, and it's like an idyllic neighborhood. And my mother was able to purchase a home there. Uh, my dad, to his credit, gave my mother the house that we had. And she, out of the resources of that, we were able to, to buy this home. And so John and I were the first two kids in private school to have motorcycles. And this is 1964. Nobody had motorcycles. And I had a BSA 650 and John bought a Yamaha. And one day we were driving down Avenue Road and we saw the police and a limousine and we thought, oh, what's that? And then they pulled into the school and John had his Upper Canada College jacket on. And what I failed to mention to you is that his uncle and godfather was the former Conservative Prime Minister, John Diefenbaker. And so we pulled into this high school, to this private school of John's, and the police on the motorcycle got off, turned to us and said, you get out of here. And John Brower turned around and he said, Look at this jacket. You get out of here. My godfather and uncle is John Diefenbaker. I want your name and number. And honest to goodness, that police officer, he just literally turned white. And the doors opened, and out of the car got John, Paul, George, and Ringo. And they were in Toronto to do their first concert. And I was on this BSA 650, and on, on my website, Get Me to the Temple of Serenity and Step on It, you can see the motorcycle, and it's candy apple red. And I had seen these motorcycles in, La in Fort Lauderdale, Florida the, that winter because the first year we ever went down as teenagers. But George Harrison came over and he said, oh, I love your bike. And uh, I said, thank you. And Did the you John have any idea at that time the impact that the Beatles would have? I mean, was, was, did that resonate? Well, it, I, I already knew who they were. Everybody knew who they were. But we were, I was gobsmacked. <laughs> I, mean, I didn't know what to say. John Brower walked over to John Lennon said, John Brower, we're going to work together one day. And John Lennon broke out laughing. Four years later, John Lennon appeared at the Toronto Rock and Roll Revival that John Brower produced, my first business oh, wow. partner. And he and I had formed a record company two years later in Los Angeles. So tell me about this trip to Los Angeles. As, as you indicated, you and John went to Los, yes, we did. Los Angeles, and then you came back, and then you had several kind of different directions that you went into. Maybe you could elaborate. Los Angeles was an interesting experience. We met a lot of really fascinating people. We were living in a, uh, in a hotel um, that was filled with musicians. Um, there's a very, very famous female artist who has sold, I don't know how many millions of albums, I once knocked on her door and said, look, if you can't sing any better than that, you should think about another career, and she slammed the door in my face. I'm not going to humiliate myself and tell you who it was. But I, we, we did so many crazy things that were so much fun. And um, it was in Los Angeles that I recognized I had a drinking problem at 20 years of age, and a year later I would stop, and I, to this day, never had a drink of alcohol, 44 years. 
but that's one of the reasons uh, that I came back to Toronto and I changed from entertainment and I went on to the floor of the Toronto Stock Exchange. So then you went into the business of finance and financial planning. Tell me a little bit more about that. Well, uh, I came back to Toronto. I had, my brother Jim had gotten, was able to get me onto the floor of the Toronto Stock Exchange in the summer from the time I was 16 till I was 20. So I had already had my summers of being down there and working with uh, stockbrokers. At the age of 20, uh, 21, I got married and I ended up working for a Montreal brokerage firm, Bouchard and Company. And I worked with my oldest friend who's still around today, Michael O'Shea, he's here in Vancouver. And he was my first boss in 1968. And um, uh, I was on the floor of the TSE and uh, those were very, very funny days. And uh, really what happened is that uh, I, I stopped drinking and then I made a decision uh, to follow in my father's footsteps and I joined two uh, financial institutions on financial planning. And I actually became some of their top producers very quickly and found out that I had a gift for sales. And uh, I spent several years there and then the manager of the company I was working for, he and I became partners in a company called Ask Corporation and we bought out the, one of the franchises for Earl Nightingale. Mm. And that was the beginning of my interest in motivational and inspirational, uh, well basically the uh, human potential movement. And we, I, I brought Earl to Toronto when I was 20 years old and um, I just fell in love with the business of business. Yeah, cool. So just kind of going back to, uh, you, you returned to college and then what did you study at that particular point? Okay, so uh, I had been married at 20 and at 23 I was divorced. And I decided that I needed an education. I went back to college, I studied journalism for several years. And then I made the realization that I wanted to go on and I went to undergraduate school. I moved out to Vancouver and I went to Simon Fraser and I did my undergraduate work and then I was admitted to graduate school in communication theory. Uh, communication theory was not film and television but rather the behavioral sciences, systems theory and political economy and mass media. Wow. So, all that being said, so how did you end up in the entertainment business? I was in graduate school, I was working toward becoming an alcohol and drug counselor. I was studying, uh, Gregory Bates and had done a lot of work on uh, schizophrenia and alcoholism and I was going to be, a, 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 an, I thought I would like to be an alcohol and drug counselor and instead of doing a graduate degree in psychology which didn't interest me, systems theory which is brand new at that point, it was very young. Uh, really fascinated me and I made a film in, in graduate school with the RCMP in North Vancouver called Alcohol, Drugs and the Young in which I'm in it, I'm 23 or 24 years old. Where is that film now? I've got it hidden away somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> when I look at it now, I'm so skinny in that film, I had one stripe in my pajamas. Yeah, aren't we all? Oh, dear <laughs> God. Um, kind of like. So, it, it, so, so uh, just kind of so, so you're getting into the entertainment business and now that's your new... Your I'm new in age. graduate school and I met a young man. I decided when I made that film that that's where my... I, I've, I left the uh, entertainment industry. I tried to do what was the respectable and proper thing to do, which I'd been raised. Uh, my mother, uh, God rest her soul, said, Oh, Davy, I want you to be in business and successful. But my heart was really in entertainment. It always was. And so I met uh, Philip Borsos when I was in graduate school uh, doing my master's in, in communications and um, we got together and made a film. I, I helped finance uh, the finishing of Nails which was went on to be nominated for an Academy Award mm. and then he and I and a f our friend Peter O'Brien and Barry Healy we made The Grey Fox which was the film that went on to garner sure. uh, both the Golden Globe for Best Foreign Picture as well as for R Richard Farnsworth for Best Actor. Uh, we've read a few of the credits. I've produced 130 primetime episodes of drama, comedy. I've done four feature films for studios, United Artists, Zoetrope, Disney. So, so now you have all this success. Yes. And then what happened in 1986? You, you hit wrong. 1986, uh, you know, I never took a look at the underlying issues that were plaguing me out of my childhood. And as a result, I ended up sabotaging myself on a feature film. I ended up losing and owing $5.2 million. And what happened is we were victims of commercial fraud. We had paid a law firm in New York City $25,000 for $4 million worth of financing.
They had represented to my lawyers and I that the money was on deposit. We paid them, and they told me to go ahead and start the movie. I hired 105 people, and uh, week after week they kept saying, "All the money will be there any day now. Just relax." And then one day the phones didn't work, and it turned out they got ourselves and apparently Sting, the singer, uh, for a large sum of money, and they got us for a large sum of money, and they evaporated. And so what it was is we were, they just saw me coming. I was so naive. I was just so naive. And uh, that was the, 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 that made me change the direction of my life. That made me take 100% responsibility, 100 responsibility and look at what happened to me. Why did I do that? And I never went bankrupt. I contacted every single creditor I had, 605. Uh, I started sending people $5 a month in an envelope, people that I owed hundreds of thousands of dollars to. Let's go back again. Uh, you got married for the, for the second, second time. time. 1987. And, and then you, what happened, uh, something happened at the birth of your son and yeah. your daughter. My, well, my daughter was the youngest premature baby to ever survive in Ontario when she was born. She weighed less than two pounds, 800 grams. And the poor little thing slept in the palm of my hand for the first three days of her life. Wow. And I can remember going in a washroom at uh, the hospital in London, Ontario, St. Joseph's, and getting on my knees, and it's hard for me to cry, you know, ironically, <laughs> I can tell another story, but I sobbed uncontrollably in that bathroom and pleaded with God not to take Laurel's life because my mom, who had been the head of the anesthetic department at Sick Children, said to me, my mother was a nurse, and she said, Davy, don't get your hopes up. It's not likely she'll survive. And the doctors at that point had never dealt with such a young child. And the truth is that, uh, she was a brilliant little fighter, but she had to change every drop of blood. She had what was called bradycardia, spelled Brady, and which I always thought was odd where her heart would stop. And I'd have to, the first week of this was just torture for me because she had tubes in her skull, tubes in her face, tubes in her, the poor thing, honest to God, she, had, she was intubated. And eventually uh, we were able to get her out and she's ended up being the most beautiful, unbelievably brilliant, graduated with honors from York University. And that for me was the most important prayer that was ever answered. And my son Brendan yes. is how I got faith. And you know, I said if there's a God, I need to understand why do things happen, horrible things happen to people. And my brain trying to understand why horrible things happen to people, I couldn't, if there's a God, like how does the, the and what happened in Southeast Asia a few years ago with the tsunami, how do you explain the Second World War with Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, where 30 million of his own people are, are slaughtered? How do you explain these events that transpire, uh, the World Trade Center? I mean, if there's a God, come on, what kind of thing is this? Except Brendan was born with 180 degree club feet. And he was going south and his feet were going north. Wow. And I had to take him from the age six days down to Sick Children's Hospital. And for the first six months, every week they would take his feet and twist them 180 degrees and put them in a cast. And at six months, they did an operation where they cut him from stem to stern across the back of his heel, sliced his tendons and stuck steel pins in. And what happened after that operation is when I took him back to that hospital, as we walked through the doors, he looked up and you could see the terror in his face. And he started sobbing and screaming. And I, the doctor said, you need to hold him on the table. And honest to God, I held him on the table and I again started crying because I, he was so afraid. And then it hit me like a tsunami that Brendan didn't understand. I loved him so much. I wasn't going to let him go through life crippled. And you see, he needed to be held on that table so that they could do the work to fix his feet so that one day he would end up being a national champion swimmer. So in the process of that, of course, you've had a, a spiritual kind of revolution, several spiritual revolutions Number around one. your son. Um, and then around with your daughter. So, you know, describe a bit, you know, you learned something about prayer and maybe you can elaborate on that or, or what did you learn about prayer? Well, here's what I learned about prayer, that prayer works. And, you know, I, I, I felt very angry at God most of my life because of what happened to me as a child with my own father. 
So the idea of a, a loving father, the, our father, I, I, I just I found it repugnant uh, because it, it just shocked me. I mean, I can't imagine praying to my father because he was not a loving dad. Now I recognize today that my dad was very sick. So the prayer for me that when I when I became aware of prayer as a tool, I began to see the power in it. And you know, the, the thing about prayer that I've discovered is that scientifically, we know for instance on healing that there have been numerous studies done that are available on the internet. You can go on Google and look at this. People who are prayed for heal much faster than people who don't, for instance. I'm, I'm, my background is a behavioral scientist. I was trained that way. So I look for empirical evidence. There is empirical evidence that prayer works. I look, I shouldn't be sitting here with you tonight, Roy. I absolutely shouldn't be here. By all, uh, my, my young years, I took so many chances and, and came so close to death so many times that it's a miracle that I'm sitting here today. The fact of the matter is that prayer changed my life. So then you got into Mastermind. So the mastermind, mastermind, I did. Fifteen years ago, I was introduced to Mastermind through a nun in Toronto, and I began with a group, uh, and we met weekly. And it was there that I learned how to pray, because I raised Roman Catholic, I prayed by rote, you know, Hail Mary, Our Father, you know, hey, Glory Be. Uh, at Mastermind, I began to recognize the eight steps that allowed me, in my new book, for instance, in uh, Aging with Dignity, Living with Grace, I use the eight steps because four years ago, January 4, 2010, uh, a mother asked me to speak to a young boy and a young man that was 22 years old and he tried to beat me to death because in truth, his mother thought he had an alcohol or drug problem. He was very mentally ill. But I had to come back from that, from losing 80% of my memory, from having my ability to do the job I did it was grossly impaired. And uh, it was through the mastermind, through prayer, that I was able to begin to heal myself along with the help of uh, some very, very insightful physicians who ironically turned me onto the prayer wheel, which mirrored uh, the eight steps. And this was a, a doctor in Toronto, a Dr. John Thornton, and he works with people with brain injuries. So today I see a whole new opportunity for me to work with others to be of service. I see a whole new opportunity to keep growing because I've been in a fog, a frigging opportunity for growth for a long time. <laughs> I'm coming out of the fog. I'm ready to enjoy some of the benefits of the hard work I've done. Okay. Good for you. Pleasure chatting with you. Thank you.